Weathering With You is the latest film by one Makoto Shinkai, a man largely touted as the next Miyazaki. But he's not Miyazaki, so we can actually cover his films without being put on the Judas Cradle. And if you don't know what that is, look it up. It's fun. The point is, if you're supposed to be the next Miyazaki, you're going to be putting out some good films, and Shinkai delivers. When Weathering With You was announced, I remember the Twitter gawkers looking at it like turkeys and being all, look at the pretty Wayne. But it's so much more than that, and even still, I'm wrapping my head around this romance slash fantasy slash mild doomsday scenario. There is a lot to unpack here, so join me while I talk about water dragons, weather demons, and a little dash of Buddhist ideals in a beautiful movie about dumb horny teens. This is Weathering With You. Let's get into it. Hi everybody, quick thing, just wanted to let you know that Tyler and I have a brand new podcast called The Bonsai Popcast, in which every week we sit down and have a conversation between two friends about anime and video games and life stuff. It's a good time, people are really enjoying it, we've made it pretty high up on the list of the best new and upcoming anime and manga podcasts, and I hope that you check it out. That is The Bonsai Popcast, we are pretty much everywhere, and we'll be on Spotify within the next couple weeks as well. We also have a new YouTube channel. Also, this is a Patreon Patreon-driven channel, so if you enjoy our content, please consider joining the best community on the web, patreon.com slash bonsaipop, where for the low price of $1, you get right in there, you get a bunch of extra content, you get one-on-one -on -one time with Tyler and I, and it's just a great, great community. Anyway, enough of that. On with the show. Hodaka is a 16-year-old who ran away from home to start a new cool life in Tokyo. And as a 16-year-old who ran away to start a life or something myself, let's just say it's not easy. It's almost impossible. Now, to his credit, Shinkai kind of nailed this part. Hoda is definitely over his head, running around the city, running out of money. He even runs into a shady Yakuza who's scamming chicks. And when he's knocked into a trash can by this thug, he finds a discarded handgun. Now, handguns are straight up banned in Japan. You can only legally own rifles and shotguns. Any illegal gun possession is 10 years in prison, and having ammo that matches that gun is a higher additional offense. Discharging any firearm in public in Japan is life in prison. Now, I just wanted to throw that out there because that is a major cultural difference between America and Japan and many other places, and a lot of people don't know that, and it's very important to the movie. Not even the Yakuza in Japan use guns because it just ain't worth the time. But Hodaka pockets the thing, probably in an act of desperation. He's stuck, a 16-year-old trying to make it when no one will hire you, you're hungry and anxious about your money running out, you quickly realize you're a liability and something as simple as a free meal is a beautiful thing. You also quickly find out that you are inevitably screwed and are going to have to shack up with the first person who gives you the chance. And that person for Hodaka is Suga, a man who saved his life by chance when he was hit by this odd storm out on the boat that he was taking into the city. Now lucky for Hoda, while Suga is kind of a shady guy, instead of having to dole out nickel bags and bull packs to morons at 3am, Hodaka instead gets to work for Suga's occult magazine company. You know the magazines, Obama is a lizard, aliens in the White House, Trump cyborg, Gestapo, the ones that publish all the real hard-hitting stuff. Meanwhile, it rains and rains and rains. Now it actually rains a lot in Japan, and not Pacific Northwest daily wetness. Like during the months of June and July, it's known to downpour constantly. For reference, it rains in Tokyo three times as much as it does in London. And come September, it's typhoon season. Yeah, Japan has a typhoon season. We have fall. Now being a borderline Eskimo eight months out of the year myself, it's hard to feel bad about places where it rains too much, but having summers where I've seen manholes shoot out of the street with geysers following suit, I can get that the rain can eventually bring you down if it doesn't stop. And the Japanese also have a very special connection with water. I mean, it makes sense, right? The country itself is an island, add in the rain, and its necessity for things like rice in particular, then top it off with the massive flooding known to take place, the hurricanes, the monsoons. In Japan, the water giveth and the water taketh away. So naturally, the most iconic deity from the Asian archipelago is the dragon, which generally governs the water but we'll get there. So Hadaka has a place to live and a job and a male role model in Suga and even a friend and his journalist partner Natsumi. And all in all, things are going unrealistically well for a 16 year old runaway. But remember that free meal I talked about before and how amazing something like that can be? Well, this 
is Hina, and she is about to throw her life away with the same dickhead Yakuza who knocked Hodaka on his ass earlier. White knighting like a motherfucker, Hoda intervenes, grabbing Hina and making a break for it until they're eventually cornered. Now this is a crucial moment for the film, and without a little cultural background, it doesn't make a lot of sense. As Hoda is being straddled and bit lapped by the Yakuza, who's about to take away his Big Mac mama, Hodaka pulls out his gun. The Yakuza actually laughs, thinking it's a toy. Most people in Japan have never even seen a handgun. This is real sh Just a year ago, a man was held up in Tokyo by a Yakuza who pulled a gun on him. The man figured it was a toy, grabbed the gun, and the Yakuza were arrested on extortion. Because it was a toy. This actually happens. However, Hoda's gun is not a toy. <laughs> and the second Hoda fires it, his life is basically over already. And he did it all to save this girl who he barely knows. Oh, and she's properly freaked out too. I mean, as you would be, you know? Firing a gun in Japan is the same as murdering someone in America. You know, except the ratio of gunfires to murders is heavily on the murdery American side. Also, Hodaka technically didn't save Hina because she actually wanted that job, you know, whatever it was. Now, one of the things Shinkai loves is teen romance. His previous work, Your Name, which we covered last year, watch that, it's a good one, had similar pillars to its story, but in truth, is there anything as magical as young love? It's such a beautiful and painful and hopeless thing, but when it blooms during its short time, it's like every second of every day is a precious balance between longing and satisfaction. Personally, when I was nine, I fell hopelessly in love with a girl, and we chased each other in circles all the way through high school. It was some of the happiest and completely soul-crushing times of my life. She was the best, and she was also the absolute worst. I remember riding my bike for miles in the summer heat to see her, or crying in my room every time we broke up or she hurt me. When you're young and dumb and your brain is still forming, everything is raw, pure, nasty emotion. There is no hunger that eats at you like young love. And while rightfully freaked out at first, Hina comes back to Hoda to show him what Tokyo can really be like with all that rain, because she is a sunshine girl. And there will be spoilers from here on out. Hina is a 17-year-old orphan who lives with her playboy pimp daddy 12-year-old brother Nagi, and like Hodaka, is just trying to get by. When her mother was dying, she ran to a nearby shrine and prayed with all of her heart for sunshine so her and her mother could take one last walk in the sun. And it worked. However, her mother passed away. Now, through her prayers, she can make it sunny in her vicinity, which she shows Hoda on the roof of the abandoned building they escaped to after the gunfire incident. However, after this prayer, strange phenomena begin to take place within the rain falling on Tokyo. Little fish-like creatures begin to appear before people and then proceed to vanish into steam. Meanwhile, Hoda and Hina become much closer, and while budgeting her life out, they come up with the idea of selling her sunshine girl abilities as a service. It's an endeavor that proves to not only sustain Hina and her brother, but one that makes Hina extremely happy. She's able to use her gift to make the people of Tokyo smile, to bring festivals and fireworks and cheer to a city that's been drowning in rain for so long. While she prays, Nagi dresses up like a Teru Teru Bozo, a small paper doll meant to bring good weather, and Hodaka waves an umbrella with them tied to the ends. It's all very charming. However, this is a Japanese story, and we should all know by now that the inherent nature of duality will not stand for interference. And Hoda's trigger happy happening didn't go unnoticed. And the Yakuza that he made have small PV is a police informant to Lieutenant Takai, who is now on Hodaka's trail as a missing person slash gun-toting minor. Suga as well, who happens to be a widower, is in the middle of trying to get custody of his asthmatic daughter who has been quarantined due to the constant rain. Rain makes pollen fall, pollen is bad for breathing, makes sense. And as Hina becomes more famous, her requests become too much to handle, and she does eventually give up the job of Sunshine Girl amicably, but at the same time, the cops zero in on Hoda and all hell breaks loose. Hodaka is evicted from Suga's in order to clear Suga of potential kidnapping charges, which would then interfere with his custody battle. Then Hoda is tracked down to Hina's house where the cops get social services involved because two minors are living alone. Hoda 
Nagi and Hina then run away. And all the while, it rains and rains and rains. And even snows a little the more depressed Hina gets. Eventually, completely giving up, Hoda drops fat stacks on this luxury hotel room, and the three of them spend the night in teen bliss. Hina is given a pretty ring for her 18th birthday by Hodaka, but then the ball drops. First of all, it turns out that Hina is actually 15, which is something we don't learn until a little bit later, but more importantly, she's eroding away as a sacrifice to the sky. The use of her power comes with a price, and that price is her life on Earth. After a tearful embrace, Hoda falls asleep, and Hina is spirited away. Hodaka awakens to find only her robe, and is then arrested and Nagi is taken into social services. Now, interestingly enough, there is no sunshine girl in Japanese mythology. That particular part of this movie is completely made up. The closest equivalent would be a 700-year-old myth of the Yuki Ona, which is a yokai or spirit. Now, the Yuki Ona were beautiful women of the snow who generally love children, but have a tendency of freezing them to death by accident. They're also known to stop by houses in order to warm up. However, generally men, not understanding their true nature and being captivated by their beauty, try to make them stay, which inevitably makes them disappear entirely, i.e. they melt. Now this isn't generally a forceful thing, it's more of a too much hospitality issue, like offering a warm bath when they notice how cold the woman is. It can also be seen as a warning of trying to contain beauty. Beauty itself is fleeting, much like the snow and or the sunshine. In the morning, Hina awakens in a field on top of a giant cloud. Her body is now mostly liquid, which causes her ring to fall off, which then falls through the cloud and drops right in front of Hoda, who is on his way to booking, prompting him to eventually break out and take off looking for her. On his way back to the shrine, he's cornered by the cops and Suga in the abandoned building where he had left his gun. Suga, by the way, uh, to be fair, is just trying to get Hodaka not to throw his life away, but being the dumb teenager he is, he pulls the gun out on all of them in desperation anyway. And seeing Hoda's genuine love for the lost Hina, Suga decides to help instead and takes out a cop. And Nagi, as well, shows up dressed like a girl after escaping social services to lend a helping hand, because obviously he wants his sister back. But Hoda races through the shrine and steps through the threshold, and then finds himself free-falling from the stratosphere as a monstrous, watery creature swallows him whole. So like I said, water and the Japanese go hand in hand, like literally to the core. Both main religions of Japan have water deities and ties to water and flow and the stillness of water as well, the purity of water, the rejuvenation and destruction of water. And like Japan itself, this film mixes a lot of Shinto and Buddhist lore in with it. The shrine which transports Hodaka and gifts Hina with her power of prayer is called an Inari shrine, which are worshipped in both Shinto and Buddhism. Inari is a kami who covers a lot of bases, but for the sake of weathering with you, let's just stick to general prosperity. And as we all know, rain can be extremely damaging, so in this case, Hina's prayers started with one to Inari. Who clearly answered them. However, the interesting thing is Horaka's teleport. He begins his descent above the clouds, and in the sky he witnesses a giant snake-like creature made out of pure water. Now there are two significant water dragon deities in Japanese folklore. The first is Kuro Okami. This is an old-school Shinto dragon who quite literally makes it rain or snow. It's one of the oldest kami directly descending from the original twin deities, Izanagi and Izanami, who created Japan. Then, there's Zenyoryo, who's a little more interesting. The name literally means the virtuous female dragon king, and the god is depicted either as a dragon with a snake head, or as a woman with a dragon's tail. She's also a Buddhist deity, which plays into my final thoughts. That being said, Due to the very specific depiction of this dragon in Weathering With You, I believe we're looking at Zenyoryo. It is also possible, if not likely, that Hina herself is Zenyoryo. So think about this, the more Hina prayed, the more she became water, almost as if keeping the water back went against her very nature, and when she completely disappeared, the sun came out. I also have a quick addendum right here. I'm adding this as I'm finishing up my editing. I found this image of Zenryo Ryo, it is official that this is like a classic known image of Zenryo Ryo, and the exact image is in Weathering With You while the old priest is talking about the weather maiden. In fact, he is showing this picture and saying that that picture is the weather maiden 
but it's the exact same picture of Zenyo Ryo recreated. So my hunch, I, th I think it's a little bit more confirmed here now, uh, but I, I definitely want to show you this because it's super cool. Now, after Hodaka is swallowed by Zenyo Ryu, he is spat out below the clouds and flies through the sky and hovers above the field that Hina is on, thanks to these little fishy sprites that Zenyo Ryu seems to be comprised of. And at the same time, these sprites are also surrounding Hina, seeming to be absorbing her. To me, they looked like those Garo Rufa fish that eat dead skin cells, only they were eating her water skin. And at Hoda's arrival, they scatter and Hina regains her form. She runs and jumps to Hado and Together, they plummet back to the earth, and as they do, it rains and rains and rains. And uh, it doesn't stop. In fact, Hina's return to Earth basically sinks Tokyo. And after Horoka is done with his very lenient three-year probation, he returns to the city to find Hina, and in turn, he finds what's left of Tokyo as well. Now, in terms of Hina actually being Zenyo Ryo, the virtuous female dragon king, when we see the result of her coming back to Earth, we see how everything is flooded, how the rain continues to fall. And when you think about gods, and you specifically think about gods of the natural world, this makes sense. Praying to Inari for the sunshine was a disruption of the natural order of things, and gods of the natural world are obviously in control of keeping the natural order of things. Things. But we'll get to that in a second. Now in my research I found a lot of reviews and articles about this film and people generally walk away from weathering with you thinking one of two things. Either A that Hato and Hina are just stupid selfish kids who said f**k the world for their love, or the more common impression that this film is strictly about climate change and has some kind of political message. However. I completely disagree with both of these conclusions. While yes, it is a fact that climate change is wreaking havoc on Japan, causing severe storms, rising sea levels, and hotter heat waves, it's also important to remember that Tokyo is a city literally built on water. In the Edo period, Tokyo would have looked a lot more like Venice, Italy than the sprawling urban metropolis that it is now. Many of the rivers that naturally comprise that area have been filled in and exponentially more run subterranean under the city. Like Miami and New Orleans, it is inevitable that Tokyo will one day sink. It's a sad thing for sure, but losing anything is sad. However, loss is natural, it is inevitable, and it's what makes life so beautiful. Through my research and general understanding of Japanese religious philosophy, I propose that given the dialogue and imagery in this film, that Weathering With You is a fantasy love story, but also a Buddhist lesson about suffering, not climate change propaganda or something as dumb as love at all costs. What we see in this movie is people unhappy with their current situation and wishing for something they consider better. In this case, that's more sunshine. In order to get what they want, they're willing in some cases, to knowingly sacrifice a young girl to get it. This is a mentality of staving off the inevitable. A city is alive much like a human being, and like humans, cities will grow and change and inevitably die. And so will the earth and the sun, and maybe one day even the universe. Wanting, wishing, or hoping that it won't happen will lead to inevitable disappointment. Trying to halt change is an exercise in futility, as just like water, the world around us is constantly in motion, bending, curving, rushing around, and even breaking down the steadfast rocks in its way. You cannot stop change, and you can't predict the future, but you can enjoy where you are right now for what it is. You can enjoy the fact that you're able to feel happiness at all, even if it's fleeting, and that is a beautiful thing. Hey guys, thanks so much for making it to the end of the video. I'm Mike, and uh, before I go, I just wanna let you know that I definitely uh, am a believer in global warming and climate change. Just because I'm saying that this movie isn't necessarily about that specifically doesn't mean that I don't believe in global warming. I live in New England, come on, I'm, I'm here with you, I see it. Anyway, I'm glad that we were able to make this. It's been a while since we've done something that is more uh, emotional and philosophical, and I think part of that is due to this COVID issue that we've been dealing with. I just haven't really wanted to watch that kind of stuff lately. It's kind of hard to open yourself up and want to feel vulnerable when you kind of feel like you're in a cage all the time but anyway i hope that you guys enjoyed it i tried to make it nice and relaxing with the music and just have a fun time looking at this movie in a different way and as always we have to thank our super special patron of the week and this week 
it is. Steinies, thank you so much, my dude, for being one of our patrons. We appreciate you so much for allowing us to do what it is that we do. And obviously we have to thank our Super Saiyan God of the week, and that is Kyle Chris. Super Saiyan God, my dude, hitting that high tier, being being the top boy. Thank you so much for uh, your very generous donations. And before I go, there's this new thing that we started on the Patreon. We opened up this thing called Patreon Testimonials, where if a patron feels like it, they can leave a little blurb because it's like, it's one thing to hear from us that our community is the greatest on the web, but it's another thing to hear from somebody else. So this one here is from Hello Alex Hart. And it says, I've been on this Discord a whopping two to three days now, and wow, all of you are so awesome and kind. I found Bonsai Pop a little while ago, so I'm fairly fresh. In no way did I expect to be backed by not only people who feel the same amount of passion for anime and nerdy things as me, but the community on here is truly magical. I've never felt so welcomed into something before. If only school had been this cool. I hope I can bring my own flair to the online community here like so many of you do. Bonsai Pop captures the essence of anime in such a unique way that only they could do. They're insightful, the podcast is hilarious, and and that fun shows through the community they are building here. I think supporting Bonsai Pop on Patreon and joining this Discord may be one of the best things to come out of this shit show of a year that is 2020. Thank you for being that light in the world that I didn't know I needed right now. Thanks for being awesome, stay cool, and I hope to get you know you all more and more. You guys are the shit. Right out of the mouth, man. Anyway, it is 5.30 a.m. I'm very tired. This video needs to be out in a couple hours. So if you would like to follow us on Twitter, that is at Bonsai underscore pop. Instagram at Bonsai underscore pop. T-W-I-T-C-H dot TV slash Bonsai underscore pop. And I, I'll see you. I'll see you next week. Thanks so much for watching, guys. You're the best. My name's Mike. This is Bonsai Pop. I'll see you next time.